Well, good morning, church family, and, and welcome to the worship services of the little local church that calls herself Fellowship. We're so glad that you chose to join us today. My name is David Carter, and I get to be the youth pastor here. And on behalf of the congregation, uh, we are just glad that you chose to, to sign in and, and to watch with us today. We're going to worship Jesus, and it's really cool. Like today is, or this weekend, is Fourth of July weekend, and, and the idea of celebrating Independence Day gives us a moment to pause and to think, what about the cost of freedom, true freedom? Not just an event a couple hundred years ago, but what about that event 2,000 years ago? Not just the cost of freedom, but like the point of freedom. We're not just free from, what are we free for? Today we are privileged uh, because we get to worship the Lord together in prayer and in song and through his word. Today, uh, one of our longtime members, Stephen Forsey, is going to be sharing with us from God's Word, uh, graduate from DTS Seminary, uh, a former pastor, and, and now serving uh, with Youth for Christ, utilizing that attention to detail as in the accounting department. Um, we get to see him uh, bring us God's Word this morning. So I hope that you will join us, stand and sing with us, pray with us, and as God's Word is rightly uh, proclaimed, uh, may it bless you and encourage you to follow Christ in the days ahead. Just a reminder, we are meeting in person doing our drive-in services. That happens on Sundays at 1030. We'd love to have you come and join us. And if not, we'll keep doing this for you. And we look forward to gathering together face-to-face -to -face in the very near future. So let's begin our worship this morning with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. Because we recognize that today we are free. Yes, we get to live in this nation that is free. But as believers, as those who belong to you, we are truly free because of what you have done. Your life, your death, your resurrection. We thank you and praise you, Jesus, for setting us free. Freed from our sin, from death. Freed for a life pursuing you. An eternity with you, in fact. Today, as we gather together, Father, as we come together as your people, we ask for your presence here with us. Lord God, we pray for Stephen as he, pray, or as he, as he proclaims your word today. Father, open our hearts and our minds to hear from you. As we sing, may our uh, whole being be lifted up in praise and adoration of you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then, Father, as we end our time together this morning, send us forth to be a light to the world, to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel calling you have placed upon our lives, to serve you as we await the return of our Lord Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray these things. Amen. to offer Holy One I'm humbled by all that you've done And even though I walk through the valley I don't have to fear no You have called me from my sorrow to gladness and I have it what more could I want so raise my faith a little higher set my spirit on fire Lord we're asking you to move cause you're the God of restoration the one who gives salvation oh let Come. 
You are the God who calms the sea. The same God who healed me. You are the one who makes me strong. And even though I walk through the valley, I don't have to fear. No, 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 no. You have called me from my sorrow to gladness, and I have it. What more could I want? So raise my faith a little higher. Set my spirit on fire. Lord, we're asking you to move. Because you're the God of restoration, the one who gives salvation. a little higher, set my spirit on fire, Lord, we're asking you to move, cause you're the God of restoration, the one who gives salvation, oh, let revival come, let revival come. Joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring now. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. So now my hands are up higher. You set my spirit on fire. Lord, we're restoration, the one who gives salvation. Oh, let revival come. So raise my faith a little higher. Set my spirit on fire. Lord, we're asking you to move. Cause you're the God of restoration.
You understand me. You understand me. Come to me in the valley of unknowns. You understand me. You understand me. You understand.
Good morning. Glad to be with you here today. Glad you're here with us. I uh, want to make this a day of encouragement as we look into the scriptures. Uh, you know, um, I was uh, preaching uh, a previous Sunday uh, uh, many years ago, several years ago, and uh, the electricity went out. And so we lit the candelabra, and during my sermon, I backed into it, barely, almost knocked it over, and caught the church building on fire. Well, now we're negotiating with a pandemic, and uh, we just trust God that we'll all get out of here safe uh, by the end of the morning. So let's uh, start with prayer, and we'll look into the scriptures. Father, we lean upon you to teach us uh, through your spirit, indwelling spirit, that you would open your word, open our eyes, and help us to receive the good news, the, uh, the, the beautiful news of what Jesus Christ has done for us, what he means to us, and what our future is with him. And we pray in his name. Amen. Um, you know, this year I got a, we, our family received a Christmas present from my oldest son, uh, and it's lasting all year. Uh, as it turns out, it is a popcorn of the month club, and uh, we've had so many different flavors. I had no idea. Some of them have been pretty darn good. Uh, we've had uh, chocolate drizzled strawberry. Uh, cookies and cream. One of my favorites was tangerine vanilla caramel. Uh, and probably the most unusual one we had recently was bacon cheddar, which you may have um, a liking towards or not. Um, but uh, we are enjoying that dessert. Uh, we would normally think of popcorn as butter, um, caramel, something like that, salted, of course. And uh, we are having these culinary delights every month. And you know, as I study our salvation, uh, the deeper it is, the deeper it goes, uh, the more aspects that are revealed. Our salvation is more than just forgiveness of sins, more than just uh, rescuing us from eternal punishment in the lake of fire. It's so much more than that. And those of us who know God's salvation, we can focus on those great things. And many of them are still ahead of us. Um, not all of them. Uh, there's a great passage in uh, 1 Peter 4.10 that talks about the manifold uh, grace of God. Manifold meaning that there are many aspects to it, many branches of it. I think of an man exhaust manifold on a car or something like that, where it has different branches and different aspects. And God's grace is like that. It's kind of like a diamond that has all of these uh, special cuts, these special uh, angles where light can go through. Um, and as the diamond is moved, there's different lights, different colors, kind of like a prism where one source of light comes through and you have a whole array of colors. And God's salvation is like that. His grace is like that. His salvation is like that. And I want to bring something before you today to make you uh, consider another element of his salvation that most of us never think about. Um, those of us who are Gentiles today in the church, we don't think about this. Now, I say Gentiles because we're going to look at the book of Hebrews. Uh, it's a book that was written to the early church in Jerusalem, which was basically all Jewish. They had the whole Jewish heritage for hundreds of years, and their point of view was based out of their background. And so the writer to the Hebrews is increasing their commitment to this new Messiah that they are receiving, that they have believed in, Jesus Christ, and they are moving them from a, a Judaistic 
pharisaical system into the freedom of Jesus Christ in the early church. And so I want to take you there this morning. Ephesians 1 is uh, chapter 1 is one of those places in Scripture that gives us more or less a list of at least some of the benefits of our salvation, of being believers, Christians. Um, and I'm going to list 12 of them. You could, you could study one of them every month and, and begin to enjoy your salvation aspects throughout a whole year, kind of like we're enjoying the popcorn. And each one of these is priceless. As we go through them, it's easy to gloss over them, to not think, just to let the words go through one ear and out the other. But if we stop for a moment and think a little bit about these, we have a tremendous salvation from God, way beyond forgiveness, but it includes that. One is holiness. Holiness has been given to us. It's not our holiness, but it's the holiness of Jesus Christ has been given to us. Um, the second thing is blamelessness. So as you go through this first chapter of Ephesians, you'll find him describing these as every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The third one is uh, predestined to adoption as sons. That's a precious thing. The next one is redemption through his blood. Forgiveness of our trespasses, and that's usually what we think of, according to the riches of his lavish grace. The knowledge of the mystery of his kind will, knowing that God has a purpose for us and it is accompanied with kindness. Uh, the next is an eternal inheritance. I have no idea what that is, but it's going to be good. It's something to hang on to. I'm looking forward to it. The next is sealed with the Holy Spirit. Sealed with a seal that cannot be broken. Um, and the Holy Spirit is a seal of promise, we're told, for the redemption of our bodies, for our resurrection, when our bodies are made like Jesus' resurrection body. I'm definitely looking forward to that. The hope of his calling. The hope of his calling is not some wish. It is um, based on facts. It has a foundation. It is a secure hope. Uh, the eleventh one would be the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And I think he's actually talking about the value of the body of believers to God. He values this body that the Holy Spirit has incorporated together as the body of Christ. And the twelfth one is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us. So in this life, his power changes our life, changes our, our desires, our intentions, changes our relationships for the better. Uh, Romans 11 puts it this way, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. What does unfathomable mean? It means it is so deep, it's, it's infinitely deep. It's so deep you can't get to the bottom of it. And so here I am studying salvation and you with me this morning. And we will begin to see some of the other factors maybe that we have not considered that are part of our salvation, but they're unfathomable. You know, they, they come from an infinite God. So wouldn't his salvation incorporate an infinite number or an infinite depth of meaning for us and for our future? So I'm looking at the book of Hebrews with you this morning. As I mentioned, a book to uh, the Jews of the early church. It was all Jews from the beginning. And I want to look at two verses from chapter 2. And uh, what I want, to, want you to see is his phrase, great salvation or so great salvation. We don't have language like that in other places. It's kind of unique to this passage. And it, it highlights, it magnifies this salvation. It is so great, you don't want to miss it. Of course, if you do miss it, 
it's not a very good thing. It's, it's actually a very severe judgment that awaits those who do not believe. And so let me read those two verses, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, and then I'm going to skip 2 and go right to 3 to, to carry through with the thought. For this reason, he's talking about what he spoke about in uh, chapter, two, chapter 1, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. And then verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? God's salvation is free. It is a gift. It is by faith. And it is so great that if you refuse it, there's no hope for you. There is nothing else. And God has made it that way. Uh, he begins with warnings. While we're talking about our great salvation, there are strict warnings. In fact, there are five warning passages in this book of the Hebrews. And we're going to talk about why he's warning them so much. But he's warning them that they must pay attention to their salvation. It's not something that happened once when I was a kid and I don't have anything to do with church anymore or anything to do with Christians because they're all hypocrites. Uh, you have to pay close attention to it personally, individually. He says we must not drift away. So it has the sound of a... Like the, I grew up in Southern California, the ocean, there was a riptide, a cross tide, a pulling of the current that could pull you under or take you way down the beach and you come out and you have no idea where you are because it has just caused you to drift so far away. That can happen to believers. And there was a danger that that could happen to some of these uh, who were in the audience of this book. We do, by the way, I'm not sure who the author of Hebrews is, so I'm just going to refer to him as the author of Hebrews. But we know who his audience was. And so uh, the third warning, uh, phrase of warning, is that we should not, we will not escape if we neglect it. So neglecting it is the warning. Don't put it aside. Don't minimize it. Make it a priority in your life. Make it important, and you can tell what's important to people. They talk about it. They spend their money on it. They watch it on TV or other, some other place, sports, whatever it is. But your salvation uh, is not just a one-time thing of the past. It's something that carries through eternity. After all, it is eternal life. And so what we find is that God's favor for believers is lavish, but his judgment upon unbelievers is severe. And there's no in-between there. Uh, either you believe God or you don't, and you accept the consequences. Uh, Romans 11.22 tells us that very thing. It says that, Behold then the kindness and the severity of God. The kindness and the severity. To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you'll be cut off. If you drift away, if you fall away from the truth, it's really revealing that you were never into that truth. You never truly accepted it from the beginning. And it has never taken hold of your life. So we cannot dilly-dally. We cannot play games with God over the issue of salvation. Our lives are day-to-day, -day, routine after routine. We can easily go, go to sleep spiritually or fade or drift away. And so the warning is, don't let that happen. Wake up. And my question is, are you getting the message? Don't be in a daze. Don't be asleep. Don't be yawning over spiritual things. Wake up and get serious about them. And you must know where you stand. You must know what you need to believe, who you need to believe, and you must believe it. 
So those are the warning passages, and we must take those seriously. We find that salvation is, the means of salvation is by faith and faith alone. And so we see these Jews are now not placing their faith as they did in themselves in keeping the law and performing the ritual uh, sacrificial system requirements, but now their faith is simply in the person of Jesus Christ, who is now their king, their Messiah, and their savior. And that is by faith. It's interesting that it is a faith because that's contrary to the way our culture and our world thinks. Uh, the world thinks that you've got, to, uh, it's ridiculous to think that a person believes this story about a man 2,000 years ago that died on a tree. And if you believe that, when you die, you go to heaven. That's ridiculous as far as the world is concerned. It just doesn't, it's so shallow, it doesn't even make sense. There's no weight to it. How could that be? And yet, that's what God says. It is so important to God that you believe who he is and what he says that he will save you if you come to him in that way. Uh, religion, I'm speaking as opposed to religion. I believe in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Religion, organized religion, I should call it, uh, would say that it's not enough that there has to be um, effort, there has to be good works, there has to be a good life. And um, the thing is, uh, people who don't need a Savior can't be saved. It's for those who are lost, for those who recognize that God calls them sinners. But if they will call upon him, he will save them. And it's as simple as that. Uh, faith is the perfect test for trust. You know, if you can believe a person, believe what they say, it's coming out of their character. You can trust them, and that relationship can deepen. But if there's a person who doesn't always tell the truth, you have a hard time trusting them. You can't develop, the, their walls go up, and you can only go so far because you're afraid you're going to get burned by that person. And so faith, trust in a person is what we're talking about. Um, it's not blind faith. It's faith based on uh, the knowledge of the scriptures and the God and his son that we believe in. You know, Satan started out well as a high-ranking angel in heaven, but he didn't believe God. He didn't believe God had his best interests. Uh, he believed that he had his best interests at heart. And so he persuaded a third of the angels that he could make their advancement and their condition and their environment so much better than God could because God is all there just for himself. And so Satan didn't believe God, didn't trust God. And so then when the universe was created and two people were put on the planet in the garden, he tempted them to disbelieve God in the same way. No, he doesn't have your best interests at heart. You can't trust him. But you can trust me because I'm telling you how it really is. And so that's how this evil started. And it, the test is te the test of faith and trust. And that's why faith is the means of salvation. It's simple. We, we can't save ourselves anyways. So it can only be received as a gift by one who believes they are a sinner and that calling on the name of Jesus, they can be saved. Uh, look at Hebrews, uh, same book, chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's how important faith is. Either you believe him or you don't. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, in other words, that he exists, there is a God out there, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. God's favor is lavish on those who believe him. And that's what we believe. That's, that's um, where we're coming from. And so God requires that a person believe him, trust him, and rest in him. Um, 
John, uh, in John 3, 17, we find uh, John talks of Jesus and says, he who believes in him is not judged. Believes, not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. You're already scheduled for judgment if you're an unbeliever. So it would behoove you to be a believer, to accept this salvation, this great salvation. But the human heart is hard and blind. So we have a question here. Why is the author warning these Jewish Christians? Why is there that need? Like I said, there's five different passages where he's warning them, uh, very serious warnings. And what is all that about? Well, let me explain a little bit about uh, their scenario and where we are in the scriptures. This is an early book uh, written to the early uh, status of the church. And so we must realize uh, what is their context. It's, it's from Judaism. And most of us Gentiles are not uh, privy to, to those things. And so we're ignorant of them. But... Um, one person has said that the book of Hebrews was written by a Hebrew to other Hebrews, telling the Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews. And tongue in cheek, uh, it, yes, that's, that's true, but we need to understand that these were Jews coming out of Pharisaical Judaism. What the Pharisees did was they took the Mosaic law and surrounded them with a bunch of man-made laws. And those laws became the priority. Their goal was, their intent was good. If they kept all these other laws, it would keep them from violating the Mosaic law. But what they found was all of these other rules and they neglected the Mosaic law. And they came to a belief that if they could keep all of these different laws, then God would receive them. God would accept them. And that it just it wasn't the case. And so when Jesus came on this, this scene, uh, he spoke the truth about the nature of, of uh, the human nature, about the need of salvation, and that he was their uh, Savior, their Messiah. Uh, we find that as the apostles spread the gospel through Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, with signs and wonders, uh, that the Jews, many of them, were coming to Christ, that they were believing. This was after Jesus' life, after his resurrection and ascension. The apostles were spreading the word, especially with the resurrection now. I mean, what, what, other pro what greater proof is there that all of this is the case than the fact that this man not only died for our sins, but he rose from the dead? And uh, that's a very important part of the gospel. And so there are many proofs throughout uh, the book of Hebrews and the scriptures about who Jesus was that allowed some of these Jews to become Christians in the church in Jerusalem. Uh, the, the, I'll just mention three of them. First of all, the Old Testament scriptures validated Jesus. Jesus fulfilled like 300 uh, prophecies in, in his uh, days of ministry, three years of ministry, especially involved in his crucifixion. If we go back to chapter one of Hebrews, this is where we go back and see the reason for why he's saying these things. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, after the fathers and prophets, God has now spoken through his son, who is creator and heir of all things. And so we find that they came to understand that he was God creator and that he will be the one who sums up all of human history, finally with his kingdom and his second coming. <clears throat> uh, the second thing was that Jesus was resurrected. Uh, there was evidence of that. Over 500 people saw him at one time. And he not only was resurrected, he was ascended to the right hand of the Father, and to the majesty on high. Uh, Hebrews 1.3 says, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That uh, implies that there was a resurrection. He ascended, is sitting at the right hand, and that he's coming again. 
because the scripture tells us that he sits at the right hand until the father makes his enemies his footstool. And so that implies that he's coming again. So all of those things were, were, were truths that these new Jewish believers um, had grabbed, had clasped. The third thing is forgiveness had finally been obtained. There is no more need for the sacrificial system that repeatedly sacrificed animals that could not really bring forgiveness. But it says in Hebrews 1.3, he made purification for sins. Very small phrase, he covered it all. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as John the Baptist said. And so believing this teaching, these, these Jews who are now becoming Christians and believing in Jesus as their Messiah, it was called the way. It became very inconvenient for them because the Jewish society did not receive Jesus as their Messiah. And so as they lived in their communities, there was this conflict that was created because of this there was actually some family troubles because of believing in Jesus and not believing in Jesus. And so it was, it was very challenging. Uh, here they had been practicing a form of Judaism under the Mosaic law for 1,400 years, and now they're being told that salvation is in Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead. The evidence was there, but... It was very inconvenient. It was very uncomfortable. It was a conflict in many of their lives. And we find, finally, when Stephen was stoned after repeating the history of Israel and their rejection of, of God, um, that is basically the end of the line. There were offers made by Peter and others in their preaching that Jesus could come back if they would repent and set up his kingdom. And it was offered all the way up until the time of Stephen. And, and even as he was explaining to them what they had done, there was that offer that they could have repented. Jesus could have come and the kingdom could have been set up as it had been uh, intended originally. But no, instead they stoned Stephen to death. And the, the offer has not been given to Israel since that time. And Israel has been set aside so that the church could be a time uh, when Gentiles, uh, by majority Gentiles, come into the church, hear the good news. And so that's where we are today. So there was social pressure applied to these new Jewish believers um, to attend the temple or synagogue if they were somewhere else in Israel, present their sacrifices. What do you mean, families would say? You're not going to the temple? You're not presenting sacrifices? What's wrong with you? This is what we've lived with for 1,400 years. And they had to stand on their faith that Jesus has come. And he is the final sacrifice. There, he, is, he is the end of sin that God has taken care of. And so just think of all the eating and washing rules and all the just the cultural things that came from the book of the law, the civil rules and so forth. And they did it continuously. But now these people were not doing those. They were not following through with some of the traditions. So there was great pressure. And what it turned out to be was being excommunicated potentially from their temple or synagogue, being publicly made uh, to be a nuisance, to be, to be shamed, or even the confiscation of their property. And so we find in Hebrews 10 that these believers had already invested in their faith because of what this describes here. It says, remember in the former days, the early days, when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one, an eternal one. 
Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. So he's encouraging them, don't go back to the sacrificial system, to the temple, to the synagogue. Come to the gatherings of the assembly of believers in Jesus Christ. And so some of these new Jewish believers were falling back into their old ways of Judaism, into the sacrificial systems, just to avoid the social pressure to conform. Um, this was a very dangerous thing for them to do. There, therefore, we have these warning passages. Look, look at the way that this behavior is described in Hebrews 6.6. 6. Those people that are going back to the sacrificial system, they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. To, to go back to the sacrifice, which implies that's where I get forgiveness, which they never did, really did, was to forsake, it was to disgrace their faith in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. Uh, Hebrews 10, 29 says, These people trample underfoot the Son of God and have regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which they are sanctified. It, they have been set apart to receive this truth, and they're forsaking it for their culture, for what they grew up with. How much severer punishment do you think these people will deserve? So it's a, a, a very needed uh, warning to these people no, you've already invested. You've seen who Jesus is. The Bible has shown it to you, the Old Testament. Um, and you have a company of people that could welcome you as part of the body of Christ. And they had to make a decision. Which way were they going to go? Uh, you remember that uh, Jesus talked about four different kinds of soil. And one of them receives the word, but quickly falls away because of trouble or persecution. And that describes these Jews going back to their former uh, religious system. Jesus said, the soil or the one on whom the seed was sown on rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but he's only temporary. And when the affliction or persecution arises because of the word, the truth, immediately he falls away. So he had no root. He was not there. He did not take it personally and grab onto it. You know, it's predicted that in the latter days, which I believe we are in, that there will be others, there will be some who fall away from the truth. And we are already seeing that, uh, especially some of the Christian celebrities. We're seeing that they're forsaking Christianity totally for whatever reason or whatever excuse. Um, in 1 Timothy 4, uh, verse 1, Paul says, The Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith. Sounds similar to drifting away, doesn't it? In uh, 2 Timothy 4, 4, it says, They will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. And so... Um, we're seeing that kind of thing. I, I saw back in April where the uh, Lutheran Danish Bible Society has omitted the word Israel out of their Bible. And Israel is so connected with God, it's almost like, well, why didn't you just remove the name God too? Uh, it, it's unbelievable. So now they have a Bible that refers to a Palestinians instead of to the historical Israel of God. Uh, and God's not finished with them. So that's why the author to the Hebrews says we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that we do not drift away. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Well, in Hebrews 10:31, Here's, here's the bottom line. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And that's the warning that was their choice to make. God is severe with those 
who will not believe. Now, I want you to see a little aspect of this great salvation uh, next, and I want you to understand what it is. I want to give you uh, some foundation for greater hope during these troubled times. Um, the Jews, uh, as you know, were still enthralled, like all of the Old Testament saints were, with this coming messianic kingdom. Uh, there were many prophecies of what it would be like. There would be health. There were, it's everything the prosperity gospel people claim for today, which isn't true. But it, it will be true in the next season, in the next period of time in the kingdom. There will be no wars. Um, there will be sin. There will be death. But it will be very limited. And Jesus will rule over the, earth, over the, the world. Now, they knew it in the sense of the Messiah, and they looked forward to that. In fact, if you look through the Old Testament, there's virtually nothing about heaven as far as a place for them to go. They were going to be resurrected on the earth to enter the kingdom. Heaven was where God and the angels abode. But then, you see, when Jesus began to teach, he began to teach about heaven as if it were a place where we could lay treasure, where a person could go in their afterlife. And so he began to teach about that. And we as Christians, that's all we think about is dying and going to heaven someday. That's our salvation. But I want you to understand that's not what these early Jewish Christians were thinking. They were still thinking there's going to be a kingdom. There's going to be this amazing time when there's no pollution, there's prosperity, all plant life, the animal kingdom will be at peace. It's going to be incredible. And Jesus will rule for a thousand years. That's what they were looking for, these uh, Jewish believers. And that was part of this great salvation. And I'll show you how I come to that conclusion. Um, uh, we see in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5, For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. Now, now wait a minute. Didn't subject to angels. What he's saying, angels long to look into human salvation. They're not part of that scheme. It's to human beings that God has promised this world to come. Now, what world to come is he talking about? Is he talking about heaven? I don't think he is. I think he's talking about this kingdom era when their Messiah would demonstrate his glories on this planet. And we know Jesus will have his opportunity for a thousand years to make out of this place what he wants. And so we, in chapter 1, we find all of these messianic passages uh, from the Old Testament that are being quoted about the Messiah, uh, about God installing his king on Mount Zion, uh, about the Messiah's kingdom, the Messiah's throne, the nations of the earth will be his inheritance, and earth will be his possession. It is an earthly kingdom when Jesus comes again, that he's going to set up on the earth. Uh, one of the major passages is Psalm 110, a messianic psalm. I'm going to read four verses from there that are quoted here in verse 13 of chapter 1. It says, the Lord says to my Lord, that's God the Father, Lord, speaking to Jesus Christ, my Lord, he says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So there is a time period when Jesus is at the right hand of God waiting for a time when his enemies will be made subject to him. The second verse, uh, this is from Psalm 110. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. Jerusalem was known as uh, the, the hill there as Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Jesus is not ruling in the midst of his enemies from heaven. He will come to the earth and rule and take care of all of the enemies when he comes. Verse 5, the Lord is at your right hand. Jesus is at the Father's right hand. But notice the future tense. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. The Lord will judge among the nations. 
He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. And so the problem is Jesus is still sitting at the right hand of the Father. It's not really a problem, but to this view, his enemies are not yet a footstool to him. He has not shattered kings. He is not judging the nations, and he's not reigning from heaven today over the earth. Those things are for the millennium. And I want to ask you a question. How many years is the kingdom away, potentially, potentially, if the rapture occurred today? So if the rapture occurred today, how far off is this kingdom that we're taught? It's, it just seems like it's, oh my gosh, it's somewhere way in the future. It's potentially seven years. If the Lord were to come today and rapture us out of here, It'd only be seven years away. We'll be coming back with him to rule with him and experience this great salvation, this aspect of our great uh, um, salvation. And I believe very strongly from the way this, these things are structured that the author speaking to these Jews, that's what he's appealing to them. Don't miss this. This is what every Jew is looking for. But it's only the true Israel that will be there, the believing Israel. And so um, how do I know that the kingdom is not now? Well, if you look at chapter 2, where we are, verse 8, it says, and it's quoting again from uh, Psalm 110, you have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. In other words, there's not one thing that Jesus will be made superior to, that that thing will be humbled, it will be uh, put below him, under his control. And we, we think, well, Jesus is reigning today from heaven, right? But listen to this verse, the rest of it. Yet now we do not see all things subjected to him. Well, when are all things going to be subjected to him? When he comes back, sets up his kingdom on the earth. And so this very passage, you know, it, it, we, in the verse before we saw where it says, I've been talking about this, about this, this age to come. Well, where, did, where was he talking? Well, you go back to chapter 1, and it's just full of messianic promises for the earthly kingdom of Jesus, of Jesus. And so, yes, he's been talking about it, but we don't recognize that. We don't even look up those references to see what it says in those passages. So Jesus has to reign on the earth. Not only does he have to, will he come when he... Um, uh, when all his enemies are made his footstool, but he has to reign un- through till the end of time so that he can put all things under his own feet. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 says, Then comes the end when, his ha- when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So it's that similar language, putting his enemies under his feet. Well, let's think about this for a moment. So the Antichrist and the false prophet from the tribulation period are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. They're going to be the first ones there, and they're going to be by themselves for a thousand years in the lake of fire. That happens at the end of the tribulation. Well, those, okay, those enemies are taken care of at that time. At the beginning of the tribulation, Satan is put into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. Well, that kind of takes care of him, except Jesus releases him at the end of the thousand years, and he creates another rebellion against Jesus. But then Jesus sends him to the lake of fire. Then there is the second resurrection of unbelievers that go to the great white throne judgment, And we're told that death, or Hades, where all of the unbelievers were, they will end up being thrown into the lake of fire. It says the first death will be thrown into the second death, the lake of fire. And the last enemy, this passage in 1 Corinthians says, is death. And that's called death, when he takes all of the unbelievers and gets rid of the grave 
and those people, and it's all in the lake of fire. That's so. When is that? Well, that that is pretty far down the road. Jesus has to reign on this earth until he accomplishes all of those those tremendous things to rid us of evil, of unbelievers, and to live with him forever. So, we have lots to look forward to. It's part of our great salvation. What, what, are, what have we learned from this lesson today? Well, we learned that the favor of God is lavish upon believers. We also learned that the judgment of God is severe for unbelievers. And either you believe or you don't. Uh, we find that we must take things, spiritual things, seriously. And I'm, I'm not just talking about spirit, spiritual weird things. I'm talking about spiritual biblical things. We must be serious about those. Um, and I, I wonder, does that consume you? Is that a major part of your time, your money, your conversation, your life, Jesus Christ and the scriptures and our hope. I hope that all of us will begin to uh, encourage each other and ourselves with this future that we have in the kingdom because our place as the church, we are the bride of Christ. Israel are the subjects of the king, but we are the bride of Christ and we will rule with Jesus as his bride, and we're told that the millennium for us is the marriage feast of the Lamb, while he rules over Israel, and they become priests over the Gentile nations of the world. And so that's how the kingdom is laid out for us. We've learned that a person can drift away from the truth. They can neglect spiritual things after some time that we thought that they were there. And my understanding to that is they were never there in the first place. They tasted of it, they liked it, it sounded good, but they had no roots. There was no real life there. It was like one of those soils that uh, did not ever bear any fruit. Um, we also, my question to you is, will you hold up when difficulties arise. And that's the, the difference between those who drift away or neglect spiritual things and those who stand strong. We have such hope, such a great future. Our roots go down, we shall not be moved. We are rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ and in his word. And so, yes, we are able to stand today and in any future day against the wiles of the devil, against the, tor the torture, the torment of the world that they threaten or whatever. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. It won't be long. And Jesus will take us out of here. We'll come back seven years later uh, on horses with Jesus to rule on the earth with him. 1 Timothy 6, chapter, uh, verse uh, 12, Paul says to Timothy, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Now, he, he had eternal life. He was already a, a Christian. He was saved. But Paul tells him, grab hold of this eternal life that you have and live it. Live by it and let its fruits be known. The last thing I might mention is just the millennial kingdom is part of our great salvation. And most of us know so little about it. I encourage you to think about it and consider the passages. You know, a third of the Bible is prophecy. And so much of it, especially in the Old Testament, was about the kingdom. And so we have this great thing uh, before us that is part of our salvation that should give us great hope. The, everything's going to be turned around from the way it is now. Right now is the testing time. It's, it's, not, it's not a time to uh, rest or retire. It's a time to, um, to live and to take the tests of faith and trust God through every one of them. So I would encourage you to um, consider the physical, earthly, uh, second coming and kingdom of Jesus Christ on this earth. And uh, let's close in prayer. 
Father, thank you for this aspect of hope that you've given to us, this aspect of uh, our salvation that is future, that we will see Israel be the people they were meant to be, where you write your laws upon their hearts and they obey. And the Gentile nations will pull on their robes and ask about their king, about Jesus. And we will be uh, with Jesus as his bride, ruling with him, um, enjoying the marriage feast of the Lamb on earth for a thousand years. And we look forward to that, and we thank you for that uh, matter of hope. We pray for every person here to take spiritual things seriously, to take heed to these warnings, to make sure that they understand what they need to believe, who they need to believe, and that they believe it. And we pray in Jesus' great name. Amen.